South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and iGrow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. northeastern, you know, South Dakota area by Wabe, where we've had all this rain, a lot more rain, okay? So we've had a lot more rain these last few years. Um, we also, in the 70s and stuff, the 80s, we did corn and soybeans, we did a lot of tillage, all right? We did a lot of tillage there. Uh, tillage is going to destroy our soil structure, right? So we're doing, with the tillage, we're doing something bad for the soil. We're destroying the, what you've seen with your water and everything, we're destroying that soil structure that allows water to go down in that soil profile. All right. The other problem is that we have salt that are indigenous to this area. Okay. When it wasn't wet, when we weren't tilling, okay, those salts were down in the soil profile, but they weren't coming up. Uh, the salts have always been deeper in the soil profile. Okay. So here, let's just take a look at South Dakota right here. I'm going to bring a pointer. Okay, so here's South Dakota right here. All right, here's where you guys are up by Lisbon up there in North Dakota. We're all underlaying there by what we call the pure shale, all right? And there's different formations underneath here. The very top one is called the bear claw shale. It's the upper deposit of the pure shale. So we have this shale here that's below the majority of our state, okay? Here. Is that to go? Is that to go? It's supposed to come out there. There we go. Okay, so here, we look in the upper Midwest, right up in here, all right? So this is a precipitation map right here. So here's South Dakota. Right here, there's North Dakota, we can see that. And then you look at your decades here. If we look up here in the uh, 80s and the 90s, 
we've had just a massive increase in precipitation. Okay, but what have we done? We've changed our, our cropping system from typically it would have been you know, something like wheat, um, you know, grazing, fallow. We've done a lot more tillage and we've added you know, corn and soybeans in there. Okay, corn being a short, or soybeans being a short, short season crop. Right here. right here. Okay, so here's the Pierce Shield. This is in Spate County right here. So this is a geologic map right here. And this is Spate County up by Redfield, South Dakota. And what they did here is they came through here and they did some sampling. This is done with the uh, South Dakota Geological Service. And they came through here and they sampled across the county site one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so what they did is they did some deep sampling here. And what they did is at each of these sites, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they were what what type of formations do we have underneath there? Alright? So that red line right down here, the KP is the pure shale. <coughs> and if you look along the left hand side here, it says elevation and feet above mean sea level. And here's the ground surface right up here. So you can see right up here on a lot of this, just across this one transect here in Spain County, we have a lot of that pure shale that's close to the surface. Well, those salts are all in that pure shale. That's where they are. Those salts are indigenous in that pure shale. Okay? And so what we do here is um, seasonal use of the tall grass prairie water was greater than that in corn, and especially soybeans and wheat rotation. Okay? We also had very, very deep roots with these prairie grasses that removed the water from deeper in the soil profile. And I'll show you that here at the end, how those uh, perennial grasses really can pump that water out. So here's what's happened, basically. We've had this abundance of precipitation in the 90s through the 2000s. We have those salts that are indigenous down there. Okay? They're not very far down. What we do is in, in soil, and when I teach my soil science classes, we call this capillary rise. All right, so lots of soil science terms here for you guys today because they teach soil science. All right, so capillary rise right here. What happens is, is that groundwater comes up, it dissolves those salts from that old pure shale, the calcium, the magnesium, the gypsum, the sodium salts that are there. It dissolves those salts from that pure shale. And then what happens is, based upon what your soil texture is, so based upon if you have a silk, a silky loam soil, if you have a silky loam soil, those salts become dissolved in that water down there from that groundwater, and now they start creeping up due to capillary rise. Kind of like if you look at like a really thin tube, or if you look like look at a um, a thermometer, and it has water in there, you'll see that it has a meniscus in there. So it's climbing up in the soil because it would rather be more attracted to the soil uh, above the surface that's in the groundwater. So capillary rise occurs, it comes up against gravity. Okay? Depends upon your texture <clears throat> depends upon your texture and your soil pro and your and your porosity. So a soil that has a lot of clay in it, okay, you're not gonna get water creeping up as much. A sandy soil, you're not gonna get water creeping up. Okay? It's in these intermediate textured soils, like these silt loam and these types of soils where we see that water start to creep up. The waters, the salts are dissolved in there. The water comes to the surface, starts to warm up in the spring, the water evaporates, where are the salt? Right. They're on your fields, right? They're right on your fields, and that's how they get there. Okay? So that's a little bit of a background about how do these areas develop. Okay, so now that we know how they develop, what can we do to manage them? Okay, how do we figure out what do we have? Okay, so now what we have to talk about is the type of salts that we have. All right, we have calcium and magnesium salts and we have sodium salts, all right? So with the sodium salts, sodium means, just like your table salt, sodium, all right? What that means, we call that a sodic soil. Okay, we call that a sodic soil. We have the problem that plants will not grow and the soil is dispersed. So dispersed means that you don't have that nice soil structure out there. You walk out there and it looks like pavement. Okay, there's no, the, 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 the aggregate stability is not there, all right? So that's what it looks like. This is a field up by Pierpont. So you get a rainfall or something like that, and you get this. 
you get this, it'll, it'll start drying out. This has a high clay content, some of this does on the surface. And nothing's going to move through here. It looks just like paving, right? Plants will not grow and the soil is dispersed. Okay? Uh, with uh, saline soil, you have calcium and magnesium. Now you have plants that, well, if you're growing plant problems, but usually in a saline uh, situation with calcium and magnesium salt, usually your water will move through that area. Okay? So if you have an area out in the field where you don't have any water moving through it and nothing's growing there, if it looks like concrete, then you might want to look at testing for sodium. Right? Saline uh, problems, typically we do have some structure there. The problem is here is that no matter if it's a saline or sodic soil problem, we have a high water table. This is up by Pierpont, South Dakota. Here, and uh, we did some field days up by Pierpont. We did some soil pits. Here, this is actually what has a buried soil horizon, but down right in here is about six feet down, and we have water down here. You can see how white that surface is there on the, on the salt right there. So that's where, the, that's where the problem comes from. So what type of salts do we usually have here in South Dakota? We have typically a lot of our salts are sodium, uh, uh, sodium sulfate, and depending upon where you are, you may have some gypsum. We also have lime too as well. Okay? But typically we're not, when we look at the solubility here, right there, we're not as worried. Lime is usually not a, a salt problem because of the low solubility. So what does solubility mean? Solubility means how much of that salt will dissolve in water. Okay? So what is the solubility of that salt? The salts that are really soluble are the ones that move up fast. Okay? What happens is a lot of these sodium salts down here, uh, sodium chloride, they have a high solubility. So the higher the number here, the more soluble the salt. So the sodium will move up fast in the soil profile. It gets up to the top. It causes the soil to disperse. It seals up. Now you have a big problem. How are you going to get that salt out of there? Right? Um, like I said, typically we have these salts right here, calcium magnesium salts. And then, of course, we have our sodium salt. Salts, but different problems and different management based upon if we have a calcium or magnesium salt, based upon if we have a sodic salt there. So when you're testing and looking at your salts and your soils, you got to define what type of salt problem do you have first. Okay, and this is what I'm talking about with this dispersion. Okay, so what's going on here? All right, so when I talk that a sodic soil is dispersed, it means that the soil, the clay particles, are pushed apart and pretty much equally spaced. So that soil is so evenly dispersed, there's really no porosity to that soil. There's no channels for that water to move down into that soil profile. Okay? So you can't get anything to move through it. The terms that we use are flocculation versus dispersion. All right? Flocculation means that the soil is held together in aggregates, that there's pores between those individual soil pads for water to move down through it. Okay? When we have sodium, that aggregate stability is destroyed. Okay. Like I said, just some pictures here. So saline stress, calcium and magnesium. You guys all have seen areas like this in your field. All right? High pH, droughty conditions, it's salty, the soils are salty, water will not move into the those plant roots. We can't get anything to germinate there. Poor germination, poor growth. But if you look at this soil here, it's not great, but there's a little bit of, there, there's a little bit of, you can see a little bit of structure on the surface. It doesn't look like pavement. Okay? Right here, these are where we have these sodium problems right here. pH typically higher than 8.2, a lot of dispersion. No water movement anywhere into that soil profile. Okay. We have erosion and we have root limitation because this soil is so dense and so hard. Okay. This is a field with a farmer that we work by, uh, up by Pierpont, South Dakota. Um, he's had a lot of issues with this field right here. He does do no-till. Uh, up here in this area here, we have a, a kind of a little bowl area here. And he hasn't been able to get anything to grow here for quite a few years. Okay. Last May, he had about three-inch rainfall that came down washed all this out. Remember, we have these sodic soils where we don't have any water moving in this the soil profile, so what's it going to do? It's going to run off. As it goes down the slope, it's going to increase in velocity. You're going to pick up that speed. Okay? 
So what happens here is you have a little bowl-shaped area up here trying to divert the water over to the ditch. Well, now we have some problems here where uh, it, 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 uh, some junk got in the ditch there, so now it flows out over here, flows into this area right here, concentrated flow. This is looking north right there from the area where we had the bowl-shaped area. This is looking south. This big here, gully right here, was not here the previous year. Okay? So lots of problems with managing these areas. The big problem we get with these sodic soils is we have a lot of erosion problems. Okay? okay, so like I said, just the difference between saline and sodic soil, just to define what these are so you guys have this definition in your hand. Okay? Salts tend to help a soil flocculate. Okay? A saline soil typically does not generally become a hard set. We typically will get some water movement with that. You can see those salts uh, go a little bit farther down into that soil profile if we get some rainfall. So that white area will appear and disappear based upon the moisture. Okay? Based upon where the moisture, how much moisture you've had rainfall. Okay? Um, water moves similarly compared to normal soils. Plants may be more negatively impacted in saline soils. <coughs> Sodium soils are dispersed or they swell. They become hard set. They come, become like pavement. Water cannot move. We have a lot of a ro huge erosion problems. It can impact fertility because of this restrictive layer, this high density, and this low fertility. Okay. So that's just a summary of what these soils are. So we're looking at, when we look at salts and soils, we need to decide, decide, is it a calcium, magnesium salt problem, or is it a sodium problem? What is the problem? Okay. So in South Dakota, you guys all know where your, uh, some of the saline issues are, but when we look at the sodicity here, we see that up here by Aberdeen and Spink County here, 20 to 30% of these soils have sodic horizon <coughs> deeper down in the soil profile, sodium in there. Here's Aurora County down here, also a problem down here. Um, more up here, you know, there's more uh, up, coming up here. We have not as much here, but really, you know, the red and the yellow, you know, 10 to 30 percent of those soils in any given area have sodium deeper in the soil profile. Okay, so is there any questions on what the problems are and how they differ? Before I go on, is there any questions? Okay, all right. Okay, so soil testing for salts. Uh, some terms, I'm just going to go through this. I didn't know what my general audience would be, so I wanted to define these terms before I started talking about them. Uh, electrical conductivity is the measure of the total salts in the soil. We add salt to water, it increases the conductivity. Same thing with soil. We can measure that in the soil testing lab. Cation exchange capacity. How many of you guys remember that? Okay. Cation exchange capacity. All right, so that is going to be the soil's ability to hold on to positively charged cations. Um, uh, SAR, so the sodium absorption ratio, okay, it's a number that we calculate based upon the relative concentration of sodium to calcium and magnesium. Okay? We typically do this from something called a saturated paste. And then the other one that we more, that most more soil testing labs use that you're probably going to see is exchangeable sodium percent. Okay? We measure the sodium on the exchange sites from the uh, Kind of change. Typically here, um, I'm going to talk a lot about this right here today in South Dakota. We, in South Dakota, the reason we did this project is because we, we know these salty areas are getting bigger. Also, when I would teach my soil science classes and I would get soil in from up by Pierpont, these salty soils, and I'd have my students go in there and uh, we test them and we come up with these SARs that are, are fairly low. Okay. Five or six SAR, okay, five or six SAR, they are dispersed soil. We try to run water through them, they were dispersed, nothing would work. We've always used in South Dakota these guidelines right here, all right? So we use an SAR of 13. We say if it's greater than 13, it's a sodic soil. Well, I never saw that when I bring my salty soils in and have my students try to run water through them. If the SAR was five or six, that soil was dispersed. I couldn't get anybody to run water through it. It's like, what's wrong? Are these numbers wrong? All right. And then the ESP, the same thing. These numbers are very, very similar. So we uh, we know this is becoming a, a lot bigger problem in South Dakota. 
all right, with the saline areas. I knew from working with the soil that I get from salty areas in South Dakota for my, soil, for my class, it's like, what's going on here? So we wrote a grant, NRCS, and we got some money to study these areas. And so what we did is, first thing we did is like, okay, we need to test, do these numbers work? These numbers of determining the cutoff values for saline, sodic soils were determined by the <coughs> National Salinity Lab out in California. So we needed to do it for South Dakota. So these numbers here are old numbers here from South Dakota or from, from California. The numbers that we look at now, if our SAR is greater than four, we consider it sodic. If our ESP is greater than five, we consider it sodic. These numbers are too high for South Dakota. Okay, so just a little bit of a review what's going on here. Okay, so cation exchange capacity, so soil science here, you know, 200. So what's happening with cation exchange capacity? Just a little bit of a review. What happened, why, why do we have sodium problems, okay? Um, past recommendations said that when 15% of the cation exchange sites were occupied by sodium, we classified it as a sodic soil. So cations, our, our clay soils here, are negatively charged due to how the formation process, the geological formation process. So we have negative charges that reside on these clay uh, sheets here, and of course we have positive cations that can be occupied on these sheets. Right? So what happens is, is when we get greater than, now in our case, we're looking at 5% in South Dakota, not 15%. We're looking at 5%. We're looking when we get greater than 5% of these exchange sites occupied by sodium, these soils then end up just like a refrigerator magnet, right? So they're negatively charged, and we need these positively charged cations on here to neutralize that charge. And if we get calcium and magnesium, but especially calcium, We'll actually flocculate that. We'll form a bridge. Negative charge on one clay, I cell negative charge on another. Throw a calcium in there, positive to negative, just like a refrigerator magnet. What happens? It's together. We have aggregates, uh, stability, form, formation. Okay, we hold that soil together. Okay, when we put sodium in there, okay, sodium has a positive charge on it, but the problem with sodium is that that positive charge is insulated. It's completely insulated. It's a small atom. You put a lot of sodium in there, you have that negative charge on those, on those clay, uh, clay micelles, those clay aggregates, what happens? Nothing in there to neutralize it, so dispersed, okay? So that's why we have the problems that we have. That's why we have the dispersion. Just like refrigerator magnets, we have too much sodium in there, we have repulsion. Okay, so what we, how do we figure this out? Right, so how do we figure this out? What we did is we took large columns of soil and we brought them in from the field from different places it was sodium. And then what we did is we did, we did some amendments as well. We worked for some uh, soil amendments. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But what we did here is we looked at, okay, based upon what the SAR is, so down here it says initial soil SAR, okay, initial sodium concentration. So here is 5, here is 10, here is 15, and here is 20. Then what we did is we started running water through this. Okay, so permeability, millimoles per hour, or mil, uh, milliliters per hour is what we looked at here. All right, so what we saw here in South Dakota, that when we saw an SAR on these big soil columns that we brought in, we brought in there about this big around, about this deep, our graduate student uh, did this work on this part of his uh, PhD, and uh, what he did here is he ran water through this, these initial ones. So we saw slow infiltration um, at an SAR of greater than four. We're doing this work with Tom DeSutter. Do you know Tom DeSutter up in North Dakota? Do you, the soil scientist, have you ever heard of Tom at all before or not? And, okay, he's doing a lot of the salt work up in South Dakota, or up in North Dakota. Uh, we did this work with Tom DeSutter. He's looking at the number he's using for North Dakota is five. So remember, we said this used to be 13. It's way lower for our soils than, than, than 13. So right here, uh, considering one milliliter per hour uh, as a threshold, the data suggests that SAR greater than four can be considered sodic because once we get <coughs> this much sodium in the soil, we can just see how much, oops, sorry. We can just see how much there that our water infiltration slows down. Okay, so that's the problem. That's the problem, and you know, here's how we're trying to uh, give some terminology and just describe the, the extent of our problem with some of these soil testing values. So in South Dakota, 
here, uh, all numbers are soil, you see to measure the total salt. We used four with a saturated paste. Greater than four, we call it a saline soil. That's the saturated paste. We'll talk about that in just a minute too. Okay. SAR of greater than 13 was sodic. ESP greater than 15 was sodic. These are old numbers. We are going to we are rewriting all of this. We're going to work with the NRCS to put out some bulletins on this. New NRCS research project for North and South Dakota. We're still going to go with four as a saturated paste of the saline soil. But here we're going to use in North Dakota they're using five. In South Dakota we're using four. An ESP of five. Okay. So a lot of different numbers here than what we originally thought, and that's why. When I go get the soil, the, uh, the soil samples uh, from, from these salty areas from the, out in the field, and I bring them in to my, for my students to work on you're doing water infiltration, I have an SAR of five or six, and it's like, oh, that's why the water would move through it. It's because there's too much sodium in those soils already at an SAR of four or five. Okay, so now when you're testing for salts, Okay. There are some questions you need to ask the soil testing lab. Because what we're going to do is, we, first of all, we have to determine the total salt content, and then we got to figure out how much sodium is in that total salt content. All right? So just a percentage. Okay. So when they extract for salt, soil testing lab will either use, most of them use a one-to-one -one extract. So what does that mean? That means that you take 100 grams of soil, and you mix it with 100 grams of water, and you mix it together, and that's a one-to-one -one extract. Okay? Then you let that sit for a little while, and you'll put an a, a EC probe in there, and you'll measure the electrical conductivity. Um, with a saturated paste, that is totally different. With a saturated paste, what we do is we take the soil, and uh, my kids love to do this. All right? You guys probably all did this when you were little. Your grandkids do it. You take a cup of soil, and you mix it with enough water just until it looks like melted chocolate. Okay? And that's called the saturated paste. You let that sit, that settles out, and then you measure what the EC is in the top of that saturated paste. So we have two very different ways of um, determining EC. Here we have a much more dilute method than what we have over here. If, you're not gonna, if you take one to one, you take 100 grams of soil, 100 milliliters of water and mix that together, you're going to get a fairly dilute solution. Here, remember, we're going for melted chocolate with the saturated paste. Okay. Why is this important? Because the EC is used to estimate the total salt. So if we're going to calculate their percent sodium, we need to know the total percentage of salts that are there. We can use our EC to do this, okay. but we have to make sure that uh, we understand the method that we're measuring the total salts. Okay. Because if we look at concentration of sodium in the, in, in the, on the top of the fraction and the concentration of total cations in the bottom, if we have a different number down here, that's going to make our percentage different. Right? So um, because the EC is used to count the total salt, is required for SAR or the ESP. Okay. So here, this is how this kind of goes. If I'm reading a uh, EC of 4, and that is the sodic soil on a saturated paste, that is going to be equivalent to a EC of 2 in a 1 to 1 dilution. Okay. And remember we're looking at the, the, our criteria for a saline soil is EC equals 4 on a saturated paste. It's not EC equals 4 on a 1 to 1 dilution. Okay. So here, and if we go take that, some labs may do a 1 to 5 dilution. Once again, we're diluting that out. An EC of 4 on a saturated paste equals an EC of 2 on a 1 to 1 dilution, equals an EC of 0 0.72 on a 1 to 5 dilution. So understanding how um, the EC is calculated is very important when you're trying to determine the total salt that you have out in the soil. Okay, this needs to be taken into account when making management recommendations. Okay, so here's a little graph, and I also should mention too, I have a very technical article uh, it's available out on one of the tables. There's only about 60 copies of it, but a lot of this information that we are, that I have here, we are putting in where we have a corn manual that was very poor when it was initially made, <laughs> and we are rewriting that completely, and we're going to have the, the chapter for saline soda soil management, that draft chapter. Ruth, you have that out in the, yeah, right I'll there. I'll put them on the registration table. We've got two, two different ones.
much with bubbles and the other. Yeah, there's also a really good one there from North Dakota. So if you're interested in some of these, the, the stuff that I'm showing here, if you want some information yeah. about this to take home and read, uh, Ruth will have that back out on the, on the table back there. Okay. So just a little general guideline too, texture is really important too when it comes to measuring our EC versus our, uh, if we're going to do it with a saturated paste or a one-to-one -one dilution. Okay. Dave Franson did this back in 2007. He's a soil scientist up at, N at NDSU. So keep that in mind that when you are testing for salts, you're going to ask for the EC. The EC is going to estimate your total salts in that soil. Okay. What that number represents is going to be different based upon your extraction methods. So when you talk to a soil testing lab, you need to know their extraction methods. Now, we've contacted a lot of our soil testing labs around here. About Iowa State is about the only one that's running a saturated paste. So if you go to North Dakota, uh, University of Minnesota, Ag Vice, uh, Ray Ward Labs, pretty much everybody's doing one-to-one -one right here. Okay. Now, what type of sodium index are they calculating there? What types of values are they looking at there? Well, pretty much everybody, Ag Vice Labs up in North Dakota, Minnesota Valley Testing, Ward Lab, pretty much everybody there is running, pretty much everybody's running the ESP. So that's what you're going to probably, that's the type of data you're going to get. Okay, so now, soil sampling for salts. All right, so where are you going to sample? The top six inches, you know? Is it going to be like phosphorus where it doesn't move? Is it like nitrate or chloride where it's going to move? So what are you going to think about for soil sampling for salts? Okay, so when we look at soil sampling, Okay, now I'm, once again, I teach soil, so I gotta use some soil terms here, everybody, okay? All right, taxonomy. Okay? Soil scientists, you know, with, the, with biology, you know, we have a taxonomy system where you classify, you know, all the different types of organisms. Well, soil scientists also have their taxonomic system as well, too, where they come up with this long name right here uh, that describes kind of what the soil is. I'm gonna use an Equine and an Aberdeen soil. These soils are more common, uh, up in the, up, probably up north, up by Redfield, but up in that area here. You guys, your soils down here probably be like a beetle soil or something like that down here, your soil series name. Fine, smectic, frigic, leptic, natridol. Okay, that's our x line soils. It's the soil series name that you would see in your, on the, on the NRCS soil survey map. And an Aberdeen, fine, smectic, frigic, glossic, Natridol. Okay, so what does all this mean right here? Fine texture, a lot of clay, cold climate. <coughs> Differences are here. All right, natric, <coughs> natric, uh, sodium. That means you have sodium in it. We have quite a bit of rainfall, and this means that it was derived from a grassland soil. Okay, so what is the basic difference between leptic and glossic when we look at this? Okay. Leptic means that you have the absolute worst sodium conditions that you could have. Glossic would be the best. Typic would be in the middle. Okay, right here. Here is an example of a leptic soil. These slides are from Tom DeSutter up in North Dakota because I didn't have any good, as good of pictures as, as him. Okay, so the sodium is very close to the soil surface. With sodic soil, you get this columnar structure. So if you see something like this out in your field, this kind of columnar structure that starts to form, and the soil is really, really hard and dense, you most likely have sodium there, okay? Glossic means that, that's, that that sodium is deeper in the soil profile. So you get it down in here, or something like that, where you see kind of that hard pan, okay? Anyway, you get these hard pans forming here in South Dakota. A lot of times those hard pans are due to that sodium in there, making that soil really dense, so nothing will grow through it, okay? Well, like I said, here, and of course these areas are going to be interspersed between each other, okay? These areas, as you know, in your field are small, okay? And they can, they, they're, they're, they're scattered out, okay? And the degree of, of, of sodium issues, you know, can change in a very short, short period of time. So here's the leptic where that sodium is more on the soil surface right there. Nothing's going to grow there. And here's that glossic over there. Okay. So soil sample, how deep, why, where? And where are we in the soil sample? Okay. Agronomic is two feet. Typically, that's what we're looking for. Okay. Now, I know there's a lot of different opinions on tile, uh, tiling in the in, in the audience here. All right. If you tiling with these sodium sodic fields is, is something that 
kind of tricky, okay? It can cause problems, okay? At least three feet to figure out where that sodium is, okay? If possible, to the depth of the tile. But why do we want to do that? It's a lot of work. Why do we want to go that deep? If we are going to tile, we want to invest in that tile, we want it to work. Okay. What happens is, if you're evaluating for a drain tile there, then you need to look down at least three feet deep. Here's why. Okay. So here's a picture. This here are three different types of X-line soils, up by Aberdeen, up in that area there. Um, right here we have the SAR right here, and then the surface below, uh, the depth below the surface. Okay. Here's your X line right here. Okay. So here we had not very high SAR at all, all the way down, all the way down to 30 inches, okay, almost three feet down. Here on, on the X line one, we started about four. Okay, so North Dakota says that five there dispersed. We come down here, what about two feet? We're at 10. Okay. With this last X line right here, we started about six. 10 inches down, we're at about SAR 15. About 18 inches down, foot and a half, 20 inches, we're at SAR of 25. And at almost three feet, we're at an SAR of almost 27. Okay. So now, you go put a tile line in here, okay? You put that tile line below that sodium horizon, I think you're gonna get water to flow in there. Get your sodium horizon here, get your tile line down here, the water gonna flow. No. Yeah, so why is it gonna flow? What's, the, what's that sodium doing to that subsoil surface? What's this doing? It's dispersing it, right? It's dispersing it, okay? So here's the problem right here that we see. Uh, that's why I don't know if tiling is a very good idea in South Dakota with, with the types of soils that we have. So when we have, uh, it's, a, it's kind of like a balance. You can think of it as a teeter-totter. So if we have quite a bit of sodium in here, okay, uh, in the soil, and we have a high EC, we'll have a dispersed soil, all right? Because we have enough calcium and magnesium over here to flocculate that soil and have some soil structure there. If we take and we start tiling and we start <clears throat> moving some of those other salts out of this water, we start moving some of that calcium, that magnesium, out of that soil through that tile water. Remember the sodium, it's going to move up and down pretty fast, okay, but once it gets up, it's going to disperse the soil. It still move if you get water through there. But you can't get water to go through there because it's dispersed. Okay, so. Right here, that's the problem. So, you know, um, may negative impact, you know, flow of water from a tile line. You know, water doesn't flow from tile, uh, so from the tile if the field still remains wet. So that's why when it comes to tiling in South Dakota, you need to know what your subsurface soils are. You need to know what types of soils you have there. You know, because if you do have sodium down deep, tiling is not really a good option. So any questions so far about that stuff? All right, so soil management. How can we manage this? All right, and I have until, how long do I have until like? 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, all right, so it sounds good. So how do we manage this? So we've looked at this a couple different ways. Okay, we've looked at this by putting soil amendments on, and we've looked at this by putting perennial crops on, and trying to put cover crops out there. Okay, uh, studies that we've done. We've worked at Pierpont, we've worked up at Andover, we've worked, we've, we have to say we're gonna put in a falcon. So Pierpont's been Greg Tobel, I have to give credit to the farmers we're working with here. Pierpont is Greg Topol, Andover is Roger and Grant Ricks. Um, Redfield is going to be, we're working with Jim Miller, crop consultant there, and then uh, Kenny Selman is the, uh, he, he farms the land, and Jerry West is the landowner. That's who we've been working with here. And then down in your area down here, we've been working with David Gillen at White Lake. So these are the farmers that we've worked with. You couldn't do this research without them, right? So what we've done is we've looked at, okay, now, if we have too much sodium there, if we add some calcium, can we improve that flocculation? Okay. So what we've done is we've taken and we put out our studies where we put all these plots out. We design them so we can do statistics on it. Because we can do statistics, you know. So um, four blocks and the treatments that we put on are going to be calcium sulfate or gypsum, elemental sulfur, calcium chloride, or no salt. Okay. Those are the types of salt that the treatments that we're putting out there. Okay, and then what we've done is we've done two cover crop treatments. Of course, we thought, you know, we're, we're, there's no, there's nothing growing out there, okay, because the salts are so high. 
drill into corn. Uh, in red field, we've had some luck. We have more of a saline soil there. You can, but, but a lot of the cover crops we just put into the soil. If we drill it into corn, we're putting it into V6. But we're always putting the cover crops, planting them probably about uh, mid, mid to end of June uh, with after these saw salt and have been put on. Okay? So now you say, I have salt. You tell me to put more salt out there. All right? That doesn't make any sense, right? I have salt, and now you're going to tell me to go put more salt out there. Okay? Well, here's what's happening. Okay? The salt, most of them have uh, a component to it, either sulfur or in the case of chloride, okay, where they're going to lower the soil pH. All right? So if we put anything with sulfur on, so if we put an ammonium sulfate, if we put gypsum on, if we put elemental sulfur on, what happens is we lower the soil pH, we release calcium from the lime, and we hope to be able to exchange that with the sodium on the exchange site. So that's why I showed you that picture of uh, uh, cation exchange. That's what we're trying to do. We have too much sodium on those exchange sites. We're trying to lower the soil pH, bump a bunch of calcium off, flood the system with calcium, and through cation exchange, now we have more calcium in solution. We'll promote the movement of the sodium off that exchange sites, get it in solution, and now once sodium is in solution, we can get it to go down if we get rainfall. Okay? Elemental sulfur takes longer to work than gypsum. Okay? So if I'm going to put out, when we look at this, we, we, when we look at the comparing elemental sulfur and gypsum, elemental sulfur, we need to oxidize that down to sulfate to form our acid to get the calcium off. So typically when you put amendments on, if you're going to apply amendments, you put the elemental sulfur on, it's going to take about six months to work compared to gypsum. So, but, uh, but you need less of elemental sulfur. Right? So anything, so what, here's what we're doing. Any amendment with sulfur lowers the soil pH, releases the calcium cations into that solution to exchange with the sodium. Okay? And we have to have formation of that hydrogen, of the acidifying of that soil to get that calcium off. That elemental sulfur, when it's applied, it's straight S. We need the soil bacteria to oxidize that into our sulfate so we can have that acid formation. So that's what we're doing. I'm asking you to apply a salt, but I'm really not asking you to apply a salt. I'm really asking you to apply something that has an acid in it to lower that pH and get that calcium off. Okay? So here, let's take a look here. This is some study here. So this is pure pond, South Dakota right here. This is our, there we go. Uh, Right here, so I don't have a very good pointer. In the red box up there, here's my pure pond site, sodium right there, 4,846 parts per million, SAR of 19, bad soil, okay? That's the first thing I'm gonna talk about. Uh, what we did here is we had, this is what the plots look like right here. These uh, plots, this was put on um, a year after these photos were taken, okay? So here's site number one, no treatment, no salt amendment, no cover crop. Looks pretty ugly. Looks like it looks like concrete. And those are the white salts on the surface. So that's the first one right there. This one here is calcium chloride. We had some cover crop on the surface. You can kind of sort of grow it right there. We had a big rainfall that came down through here after we planted our cover crop. Kind of grow it a little bit there. Cover crop we planted with barley and sugar beets. So that's that one right there. Here's gypsum down here. So gypsum. Down here, you can roll it a little bit better right there. You can roll it a little bit better there. That's the gypsum right there. Fewer salts on the surface. And here's our elemental sulfur right here. And if you look at this elemental sulfur right here, you can see that that soil doesn't have quite, it doesn't have the white salts on the surface that these other ones do. Okay. So at least in this study, with the conditions that we saw at Pierpont, where we had the high sodium, the high SAR. Now we have a lot of magnesium in this soil too. Okay. And that, that has an influence as well, too. But at least here, when we saw we put an elemental sulfur a year before, we came out and planted a cover crop in there, uh, barley and sugar beets. The barley grew way better than the sugar beets did. <laughs> I agree. And you know what? Greg Topol has a huge problem up there. He's just like, he's just, I asked him, I said, can, what, can, can we work in this field? He says, you can do anything you want, is what he said. <laughs> so, I, I, yeah. And you know, if we, what would happen? is if we start growing all these weeds for a cash crop, then they start getting diseased and die. Yeah, that's exactly what would happen, okay? All right, so 
Um, right here, elemental sulfur, you know, barley germinated, goes pretty well. Gypsum, some of the barley germinated, calcium chloride salt. So how much should we put on? We do these calculations based upon an SAR. A lot of times we'd rather use EC or ESP to do the calculations. Um, we gypsum, we put on to lower that uh, almost uh, you know, four tons per acre right there. Cost 12 cents, so it's not cheap. Uh, calcium chloride <coughs> works really fast. Okay, you can put calcium chloride on. Calcium chloride is highly dissolvable in the soil. You should not put calcium chloride on if corn is growing there. I learned that the hard way. Um, so, but it came back. I, I, thought, I thought it was going to be dead. I, we, we put some on. I told the graduate students, I said, make sure you put it down the middle of the row. I said, do not put it near the corn plant. So what they did is they went broadcast it all over. You can't even look at the corn plants with the calcium chloride. They looked like they were gone. But they, we had, fortunately, we had a big rainfall two days later. All the calcium chloride went down. The corn started looking a lot better, so I felt a lot better about that. So, you know, so Mother Nature intervened. Um, elemental sulfur, you don't need as much, all right? Um, so that's a little bit cheaper, but it takes a lot longer to react. And of course, no salt, it doesn't cost any money if you don't do anything. Right. Now, so how are these rates calculated? So I'm running out of time. I only have five minutes left. I, if you're interested in learning on how you calculate these, the information you need from your soil test is the cation exchange capacity of the soil. You need that measured, and you need the ESP. I would prefer the ESP versus the FAR. And so what we would want to do is we want to reduce the ESP in that surface soil down to at least 5%, if not less. Okay? So I'm not going to go through these calculations because I'm running out of time here. If you want to go through these, if you're interested in this from a, you know, from a consulting point for applying gypsum, I can sh show you how to do it. It's also in that guideline up there. There's some nice boxes and step-by-step -step details on how to do it. But, there, but this is the method where we use the ESP. And what we're basically trying to do is we're trying to take that. We know this is the total salts on the surface. We know what our ESP is. We test that. We want to go down to five. What's the difference between what our ESP is to go down to five? That is going to be, uh, that's what the, the math that we work out to determine how much of an amendment that we put out. Okay? I guess that I'm going to run out of time. Okay? Now, based in, since these amendments are a little bit different, the word we use when I teach soil science is molecular weight, the mass. Um, you can put on, just like with lime, a different lime product, you can put on different rates based upon what their mass is. So if I put on one ton of gypsum, I can put on 0.19 uh, tons of sulfur. Um, if I put sulfur gas, sulfur gas, I'd put 5.7, calcium chloride, 0.86, and so on. Okay. So last one I just want to mention is this here. I know I'm almost out of time. Do I have five minutes yet or not? Three. Okay. <laughs> Talk fast. Okay, right? Okay, so here, David Gillen, he's a great producer. Is he David Gillen here? I don't, not, I didn't know if he was coming today. Okay, so here's an area in his field right here. White salt. 2010. Contacted us. We got some money from the Corn Council. What can we do? Okay. So, site. We did a field day down there. 2011. Tall wheatgrass right here. Looks just beautiful. That's this old white site right here. That was soil pit. Okay. Look at this here. There was a little bit of snow out there in August. Four inches down. Very, very few salts right there. No salts on the surface. Right here, down at the bottom of the pit. Soil science, we like to talk about redox features, okay? Redox features means that you have this orange in here. These orange colors, like, you can't really see them, but right in there, right in there, that means iron has been oxidized. If you have a piece of old equipment that sits out in the woods, you don't pay any attention to it, what happens to it? it what happens to it over time? It will what? Rust. Rust, okay? When iron in the soil is in the presence of oxygen, it does the same thing. It turns orange. So I know that where I had those salt problems, down the Four foot down in my soil profile, I have uh, uh, redox features that are orange. There's, there hasn't been water there for a few, few years. Soil water, the water table is deeper. <coughs> down here, here is a pit that we dug right by his cornfield, in his cornfield as a matter of fact. Sorghum corn, a soybean rotation, water at the bottom of the pit. Okay? White salt right up by the surface, up there. Okay? So here's what's going on. Um, Oh, shoot. Okay, right here, uh, white, gray, here's our uh, soil uh, white lake right here that we did this in August right here. The wheat by the, uh, the, the SAR by the site right there. Uh, uh, I'm hitting too many buttons. 
right here, the SAR was 1. Sodium is 179. Here, the right in the, the, uh, the pit in the cornfield, horizon 1, 2, and 3. Sodium, 1296. SAR, borderline right there. Okay, we have, a, we have sodium issues there. Okay, so like I said, I talked a little bit more about this, but I'm running out of time. Bruce Kunze did work with uh, looking at, Terry Denner, a soil scientist, looking at water table depth here. Where is the water? Right here. These lines are where the water table depth is based upon precipitation. Look at this, where we had alfalfa and grass. 2010, we had all that rainfall. We had the same problem in South Dakota you guys did. Okay, too much rainfall. Even when we had all that rainfall where we had that grass and where we had that alfalfa right there, that water, that, um, that soil, that water table was considerably lower. So uh, I'm going to end there because I'm running out of time. I'm going to go here and I'm going to give credit to all my the people that helped with that research. And then right there. Okay. So like I said, I really appreciate coming and talking to you about salt here. I think it's an important subject. Lord, okay. two quick questions. Yeah. If anybody has a quick questions. Yeah, I'll be around. Yep. And so if you're interested in talking more about that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much.